Welcome everyone, my name is James. I'm looking forward to spend about a half hour with you talking about Vault Futures, the roadmap ahead for Vault. I have the privilege of representing a lot of work today from the Vault product team, our product managers, designers, and engineers, and let's get into it. I wanna start with setting some, uh, the stage and some context. The stakes are pretty high right now, and I wanna uh, talk about this image. I really thought it conveyed a pretty powerful um, idea. The idea that we're no longer just securing our computers, we're actually securing our society. This person is a security researcher and um, author, and it really spoke to me. I'm gonna see if I can convince you of that from some recent headlines and some data. So we have an election coming up in the United States, and these things are the subject of cybersecurity risks and attacks. We really need these to be safe for our democracy, so our government and the way we work together as citizens is at stake. When we look at hospital systems, last year my father wanted to have an elective procedure and it, he couldn't have it because the hospital system he was using had been attacked with ransomware and they had to cancel all procedures except emergency life-saving procedures that didn't require computer systems to, to do that. So it affects our healthcare. Last year we had an attack in the United States where our big pipeline on the East Coast was taken out of, of operation for about a week or so from a, a ransomware attack. And we also see Europe right now in the, in the news related to being able to have energy supplies this winter. And we need to be able to stay warm, right? So that's at risk. I've been the victim of identity theft where my personal information was stolen and used to open credit card accounts. I'm sure many of you have either had that happen or know someone that's happened to. And so our commerce is a subject of this risk. You look at transportation, many of us took flights, took a car service, and then we learned in the pandemic about how important our logistics are for moving goods and services around. So these are increasingly at risk and important. And then ultimately, even our physical security is at risk because we see that increasingly conventional warfare is being paired with cybersecurity. So all of these categories I already spoke about are gonna be something that we'd have to worry about if we have a conflict. Okay, so those are the headlines. Let's see if the data actually backs that up. I'm not sure if you've seen the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. It's a great report that looks at data every year. This is some data from 2022. There has been a 380% increase in data breaches the last two years. Over 80% of the time, those data breaches have involved a human element. So you can see it's no longer just the computer systems themselves, but it's how our people are interacting with the computer systems together. Nine out of 10 times that there is a breach in a web application, it involves a stolen credential. That's, if you're here for Vault and not figuring out how to, how to make that better, you're in the right place, more on that later. And then increasingly we're seeing the software supply chain being used in these kinds of breaches. So what's going on? What's behind all of this increase in breaches and why is that happening? So Armand kind of spoke about this in the keynote, but it's this idea that we're using some practices in some cases from a simpler time when the data center had a, a more of a trusted model for access and we had data in that data center that we thought would be secure if it was just our employees accessing it. But increasingly over the last 10 years as we've moved to more cloud platforms outside our own data centers, we've moved to SaaS platforms that provide services. Our environment is much more complex and that these assumptions no longer hold true. So we can't assume that it's only our employees accessing these systems any longer. It's now our employees, our contractors and partners. And it's not only just that, it's the, our suppliers and their employees, contractors and partners and their supply chain. So it's just a much more complex environment. And if you're working on assumptions that from those previous generation of model, it's, you're gonna have a lot more risk. So here's a catalog of some of those risks. This is not an exhaustive list, it's just an example. And I wanna talk through how a recent security breach leverages some of these risks together. So this is a well-known breach that happened in the last month. I won't I go into a ton of depth on who it was. But at the beginning of this, they had contractors that they used to expand and contract their workforce. In the pandemic, we see that's fairly common for people to have that kind of flexibility. But because they're contractors and they come and go quite frequently, they bring their own equipment. Well, when they're bringing their own equipment, 
it's subject to being the same thing they're accessing your production systems for, for as a contractor. It's the same thing you might be downloading a movie or a game that you don't know where it came from, and it might have malware in it. So in this case, that's what happened. This contractor had malware on their machine. It captured their username and password. And in this case, you might think, that, well, uh, good, they had multi-factor authentication, right? And the answer is yes, they did. It's like, okay, good. They had multi-factor authentication. Just because they know the username and password, that's not good enough. Well, that's where they switch to start applying other techniques like social engineering. So in this case, they reached out to that contractor, the hackers did, using a chat service, pretended to be the IT support system and said, we need you to approve this multi-factor authentication method. The contractor said, okay, I guess uh, that makes sense, I'll, I'll approve it. And now they have private network access on the VPN. They're able to scan the entire private network because it was fairly open, and they find a credential to a very highly privileged system for their break glass administrative credentials. And at this point, they have G Suite access, they have identity system access, they have Slack access, it's really game over, okay? So that is just one example, and these kinds of things are happening more and more. So when we talk about zero trust security and how to protect against these kinds of things, what are we talking about? It's an industry buzzword, but what do we mean at HashiCorp when we talk about it? So we talk about identity as the basis of security for these four pillars. The first one is machine authentication and authorization. Then we talk about the network controls as one machine talks to another machine on the network, being able to authorize that strongly and make sure that's secure. When people access machines, we want to be able to have a pillar that focuses on that and uses strong authentication. And then finally, um, human auth authentication and authorization. And so at HashiCorp, we realize these through particular products. We're gonna be zooming in on Vault, but I wanna put that work in Vault in context of this broader story for zero trust security. Okay, so let's go all the way back into the early days of Vault and see the common workflow that we use. Whether you're a client that has an application or a system or a person involved, and you need access to a system, you'll reach out to Vault and you'll strongly authenticate. Vault will check your identity and see which systems you're allowed to access. If you're allowed to access the system, we'll give you access via a credential or other access means. And so this common workflow, we can apply that to many different use cases. The first one is security man uh, secrets management. It's something that Vault is well known for doing. But there are some other use cases that we've seen um, as Vault has been expanding using the same pattern that I, I just spoke about earlier. And for certificates management, for key management, for data protection, and then remote system access. And increasingly, you're gonna see us have Vault play an enabling role to provide credentials for a purpose-built system like Boundary to provide human to system access management. So let, before I get into the depth on those use cases, I wanna talk about something we've been focused on on our product team for about two years now. And we've heard that from a lot of customers that you have to hire teams, you spend a lot of time operating Vault, and you'd like to spend more time using and implementing those use cases. And so this is what HashiCorp Cloud Platform Vault is intended to address, where you get all the power of Vault, where HashiCorp takes operational responsibility for setting it up, clustering it together, doing the backups, and letting your teams focus on consuming and implementing those use cases. As Armand mentioned earlier in the keynote, we're very proud to announce that we are supporting Azure and public beta today. You can go try this at cloud.hashicorp.com today, and we're really excited for that. Where we're going with this, with cloud management in the future, is we've been hearing from you that you have lots of alt clusters. One of the more advanced customers I spoke with this week has 42 some vault clusters that they know about and probably some others that they don't. And so it's not just about operating one cluster or uh, the, the other cluster that it might replicate to, it's about the entire estate. And we've also heard that you have clusters that are running on your own infrastructure as well as clusters as you start experimenting with our cloud platform. And so increasingly, we wanna be investing in cloud management plane that works wherever your vault happens to be and help you add visibility and manageability into that. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So in this example, we're gonna have a view of three different clusters, one self-managed cluster, one cluster in HashiCorp Cloud Vault and AWS, and one cluster from Azure. And it's all in one single pane of glass. 
We'll be able to tell you the status of that cluster, be able to tell you the version that those clusters are on, whether you need a stability patch or a security patch, or maybe there's a new feature that's available that you might want to use. We're going to be able to bring insights to you so that you, we call this the check engine light. So if you're driving a car and the engine light shows up, you probably want to get that looked at, right? So this is these kinds of things we can bring insights to you, things you need to take a look at. And then with the providers, no matter whether you're running it yourself on your own infrastructure, Vault Open Source, Vault Enterprise, or HCP Vault, you can see this all together. So we're really excited to take this further. If you have ideas for what you want us to put in this manageability plane, please talk to us. I want to talk a little bit about the security in Vault. So Vault has been open source from the beginning, and that has allowed people to inspect our cryptography and build confidence that we are using very strong standards there. But customers asked us to go further. So we implemented the FIPS 140-2, which is a government standard that tells us we're using safe cryptography. And in the past, we used to require a hardware security module to use Vault in that configuration. Earlier this year, we announced the ability to use a software-only configuration of FIPS 140-2. So this means you no longer need a piece of hardware sitting next to Vault if you want to have FIPS 140-2's um, compliance. And we're not stopping there. There is a new version of the standard called FIPS 140-3. And so we are going to be submitting uh, Vault to this new standard to make sure we're showing and demonstrating that we're keeping up with cryptogra cryptography standards. All right, now we're going to get into the good stuff of secrets management. I'm sure we've all seen secrets end up where there shouldn't be. Whether it could be the sticky on the monitor, it could be in our source code, our CI CD pipelines, it could be in Slack or our wikis or email. These secrets are in plain text and they shouldn't be, right? And Vault's been addressing this for many years. What we thought about this when we first approached this is it's not just about securely storing the secret someplace. One of the big first problems, and Armand spoke about this earlier, is our ability, who should be able to get access to these secrets once we're storing them? And we realized very early on that a big differentiator for Vault is that we could act as an identity broker. And so this is this idea that we will strongly authenticate the clients that are trying to access Vault. So whether that's AWS IAM, whether that's a Kubernetes service account, whether it's Azure Active Directory, when you use strong authentication, you can know that the client is who they say they are, and you have strong guarantees in that with cryptography. You don't just have, let's say, an API key where someone could get that API key and access it from, let's say, a hacker's machine and pretend to be that client. This allows us to have much stronger guarantees. So this is a differentiator for Vault, and we have a very large ecosystem of authentication methods that implement this strong platform identity. We have built some of these ourselves. Our partner community has built some of them as well as our community of providers. And it's a plug-in interface. So if you don't see the authentic authentication method you want or need, you can have it built. The next piece of Vault Secrets Management that is a differentiator is can we improve on static secrets management? There are lots of secrets tools out there that will securely store your secret. But what makes Vault different is we believe the answer to this is absolutely yes. Instead of having long-lived secrets, what if we made secrets completely temporary so that when the inevitable case of an, a secret accidentally getting exposed to a person, being logged or backed up, that if someone tries to use the secret, it's already expired or it's about to expire. These things are not valid for a very long time. And what goes when you make the secrets temporary, you need to think about rotation. So very early on, we put in capabilities to make it very streamlined and easy to rotate the secrets, and we made this a plugin as well. So we have a large ecosystem of plugins, some we build ourselves, some from our partners and our community. And ultimately, when you look at the large ecosystem of Vault, it's 150 plus integrations and growing. I want to talk a little bit about some of our recent investments into this ecosystem, because we think this is so important, because what Vault needs to connect to and integrate with that makes it more valuable for all of you. So plugin multiplexing is a new feature we developed based on customer feedback when they're using Vault at very large scale. I'll use a database connection example where Vault is issuing dynamic secrets for a database. We have some customers with thousands or tens of thousands of database instances. And with the traditional model of Vault plugins, every single instance of a database needed a separate operating system process to manage the lifecycle of its secrets. 
in this new model, when you have many, many database secrets, uh, the, instead of having many operating system processes, we can route that and multiplex it through a single operating system process per plugin. This allows us to scale up to uh, more, makes the plugins more efficient, fewer moving parts, it's a big win. The next ecosystem investment we made is plugin versioning. So Vault has had strong versioning for quite some time for Vault itself, but what about all these plugins? Typically in the past, you'd have to manage those SHAs, and so it made it difficult to know if the plugins you were using were up to date. And so with this new version, we have versions uh, management directly in the plugins. So where are we going with our vision for plugins over time? Today, the Vault builds many of those plugins directly into the Vault binary, and it's a fairly big thing. So if you have a bug or a new feature in one of these plugins, we have to release a brand new version of Vault. And if many of you are running Vault, you know that it can be sometimes challenging to persuade your teams to upgrade Vault. So we want to move to a model that looks a lot more like the Terraform ecosystem, where we have a much smaller Vault binary, that, a plugin registry, and you can only download and use the plugins you need. This makes the Vault binary much smaller, makes the surface area of software on those production systems smaller for just what you need. And if you have a bug fix, you can just upgrade the plugin that you want to have that bug fix in, as opposed to upgrading Vault in the entirety. The next thing we want to talk about is the Hollywood principle. So we're in Hollywood uh, nearby today in Los Angeles. This is the idea of don't call us, we'll call you. Vault hasn't supported this kind of model in the past, but in the future, Vault will call you. So let's look into what I mean by that. So in the traditional way of using Vault, you have a client and it has an, either an agent, an SDK, or you make an API call into Vault, and that is checked against your authorization and we give you a secret back. But what if we wanted to have a Vault running and integrate with something that, where I can't install an agent? And so in this way, I can tell Vault as an administrator, here is a secret. I want you to take that system over there and tell it when this secret changes. So in this model, Vault will tell that system over there, here's a copy of the secret. And because we're using dynamic secrets, when that secret expires, we'll tell Vault, call that system again and update them with the new version of the secret. So the first place we're gonna be deploying this pattern is with Kubernetes. Vault and Kubernetes is a very popular use case. In fact, we have some customers running with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pods with Vault and Kubernetes providing secrets management together. One of the things that's brand new in Vault 1.12 is Vault Kubernetes is now 1.0, which means you can rely on it at scale and it has backwards compatibility. But we're not satisfied with stopping there. We've got lots of feedback from people that are using Vault and Kubernetes together. And so we want to apply this Kubernetes secret sync pattern, implementing that Hollywood principle into Vault and Kubernetes. So let's look at how this works today. Right now, when you use Vault and Kubernetes together, let's use an example where I have a Kubernetes workload with 100 pods necessary to, to use that workload. Each of those pods has a Vault agent sidecar running in the pod. That means each one of those pods separately is reaching out to Vault, getting a copy of the secret and maintaining the life cycle of that. We wanna to move to a version that allows us to have a single process in that Kubernetes cluster, synchronize the secret from Vault to the Kubernetes secret, and this allows the pods to no longer have to run that Vault agent sidecar. They are much thinner, smaller versions of those pods, and it's a more efficient way and it has the benefit of being Kubernetes native so that your development teams, if they don't want to think about Vault at all, they can just think about using a Kubernetes secret and in the background, we'll keep that secret up to date for them. So it's a big win for developers as well. We hope to have that in the next release of Vault. We're also working on SDKs. So we have a large community of SDKs today and those are often built by our community teams. But we're hearing from some customers that they would like us to have those be kept up to date and have a simple interface that it matches when you're using different programming languages. So we are starting with C Sharp and Go. We are about uh, ready to pilot these with early adopters. So if you wanna give them a try, please re reach out to us. The next thing we learned is we can apply this secret management workflow to other places. So one of the main ones that comes up often is certificate management. We've learned that certificate management is the number two most popular use case with Vault. 
So a traditional way of doing this is you use a, a low-level tool like OpenSSL or something like that, and you go through a ticketing system to request your, your ticket for your certificate, and it might take four days, and this whole workflow, you do it every once in a while, and it's suboptimal. Vault supports this mode of interacting if you want to do that, but we believe there's a better way. What if we were to treat the certificate like we do a short-lived secret? And now we can access the vault from those client applications, say, use strong identity, ask for the certificate. Instead of issuing a certificate that's good for an entire year, we might say, make this certificate good only for a couple of weeks or a day. And we can always be rotating that certificate so that it's not a manual process any longer. When I look at some of the new capabilities we just added in Vault for this, we can store the PKI key material. This is like the private key for your certificate authority in an HSM or a KMS. This allows you to use Vault for the strong identity that we spoke about earlier and the easy rotation capabilities, but then store the secret in something that might be regulated or governed by your policy in hardware or KMS. We are also improving uh, the revocation pro process with PKI. So Vault 112 now supports online certificate status protocol. In the past, we used to have large certificate revocation lists that had to be transferred over the network and they just keep getting bigger and bigger over time. Online certificate status protocol allows you to request just the certificate that you wanna check and see whether it's still valid or not. And where we're going with this is to be able to make that endpoint work regardless of however many clusters you have. So if you have a certificate that's revoked on cluster one, if someone checks that certificate on cluster two or cluster three, they can get the right answer. And we're also improving the user experience for using PKI in the UI. We've learned that a lot of end users are not unfamiliar with PKI workflows. And so we're trying to add a very straightforward way to access PKI from Vault in the user experience. Let's take a brief look at what that looks like. You might wanna be importing a root cert um, certificate that you already have. You might want to have Vault generate one, or you might wanna use certificate signing requests. All of those workflows will be supported in the new UI when it comes out in our next release. What other workflows can we do? Now that we have certificates where we're storing some of the keys, and Armand spoke about this, key management. This is the idea. I'm, I'm sure when many of you leave your front doors and you lock it, you're gonna be leaving your house. You don't put the key and hang it right next to the front door on the outside of your house, right? So this is the idea with key management. You wanna separate the key storage from the thing that's needing and using the key, such that if that one system were accessed, they still need access to the key as well. And so with key management, we've been investing in key management interoperability protocol for some time with Vault. And now with 112, Vault 112, we are releasing KMIT base server profile. This means we're gonna be more compatible with more software out there that needs to use key management. And the big change that we're having in 112 is PKCS 11 2.40 extended provider support. It's a lot of words. That basically means Vault kind of looks like a hardware security module to other software. The first place we're implementing this is with an Oracle database transparent data encryption. So let's take a look at how this works. You can still have Vault be backed with a hardware um, security module or a KMS so that it has a hardware chain of trust. If that's something you want to do, that's optional. But now software that typically in the past had had to interact with hardware can now reach out to Vault. And this example here is an Oracle database for getting its encryption keys from Vault. Why is this valuable? Well, it's much easier to set up software, make it highly available, stand up new instances of that than it is to order a hardware security module and have that physically installed in your data center and have it be highly available. We believe this is gonna help customers consolidate their operational needs around hardware security modules to a smaller set. Finally, data protection. Vault has some foundational building blocks for encryption. So we can encrypt, decrypt, we can sign and verify data, and we can tokenize and detokenize data. So this is very useful when you wanna have applications use some building blocks of encryption directly in your applications. And we've just implemented time-based automated key rotation. So in the past, this has been on your operations team to kind of remember every once in a while to rotate your keys and have proper key hygiene. Now Vault will be able to automatically do that in the past, uh, do that for you so your operations team can just focus on using Vault. All right, so now we're at the end. We've talked a lot about a lot of these use cases. 
we've talked about secrets management, we've talked about certificate management, key management, data protection. We haven't talked so much about Boundary, there's other talks here that are focused on that, but Vault is increasingly playing an enabling role for these human to system workflows. But I want you to think back now to the beginning of the talk, and if you've implemented Vault in a way that you've moved your, your static secrets into Vault, as much as possible, you're moving your um, long-lived credentials into dynamic credentials that are short-lived. And you're also applying our other concepts of zero trust security so that your network is more secure and locked down. When people need to access systems, they're not wide open, that it's only just-in-time access. And when you're using your single sign-on providers, hopefully, instead of using something that is social engineering or phishing vulnerable, you're using something like FIDO2 or WebAuthn that can strongly authenticate your user systems. If we do those pillars of zero trust security, you will mitigate the risks we spoke about earlier. And if all of us do that in our organizations, we are gonna have a more safer society. So with that, I wanna have one more plea. If you haven't yet tried HashiCorp Cloud Vault, please give it a try at cloud.hashicorp.com. We've made some great enhancements here such that you can get your first secret in moments. After you create the cluster, we're automatically gonna create your first secret for you. And the very next screen gives you a couple of copy paste commands so that you can pull that secret out in moments. And we're also having our design and research team here at the conference. So if you want the dumpster fire sticker on your laptop, I know I do, please stop by and talk to our research team. If you're unable to stop by in person, you can take a picture of this QR code and you can participate in our future research. We'll give you swag or a gift card for, for your time. But at the end of it, we all get better products as a result if we understand what you need better. Enjoy the conference and thank you very much.